The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we welcome Stephen to open God's word to us. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and what, what a wonderful day it has been already. Uh, we thank you that the angels are now singing in heaven. And we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way it uh, shines light into our lives. Uh, enable us to feast on it this morning and reveal to us um, the truth that's contained within it. We pray all these things in the name that you've given us, the special name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So good morning. It's uh, good to be with you. And it's good that we're in this series on the parables, uh, these stories, the, the master storyteller Jesus, that he seems to have a story for every occasion and answer to every question. And it's been good that we've been able to focus on them both before and, and after Christmas. Um, most of these stories are very familiar to us. We've read them many times before. And sometimes we have to dig a little bit deep to, to get the meaning. Sometimes the meaning is, is more obvious. This parable that we're looking at this morning is only contained in Matthew's Gospel. And it, can, it comes in a section where we've had teaching on how to handle sin within the community, the parable of the lost sheep that we focused on last week, and also a discussion, a dialogue, concerning the rules around mercy and forgiveness that are to govern the community of believers. So very much relevant to us this day, as well as to those who heard it in their day. You would think, wouldn't you, that forgiveness would be rel relatively commonplace in the world that we live in right now, given the number of people who are Christians. But often we see the, re will, the reaction in, in our world is much different to the one that Jesus teaches us. Often it's the exact opposite of what we should do. And we see that particularly um, in the 
with the people who were living a more worldly life. And perhaps the reason for that is in order to have forgiveness, we need love. And perhaps the reason why we don't see it as much is because some people don't really understand what love truly is. Maybe we're a little bit guilty of that ourselves. And sometimes a diluted version of love is limited to only those that are close to us, family members, mums and dads, children, close friends. When Jesus speaks about loving our enemies, the world typically doesn't understand what he's talking about. To the worldly, if someone offends them or sins against them, it's not so much a question of how many times should I forgive that same offence, it's will I forgive it at all? Responding to wrong with another wrong is all too commonplace. And rather than having a desire to offer grace, sometimes what we see is a thirst for retribution. As we read through scripture and as we focus particularly on what Jesus said, we realise his way is much different to the way of the world. And therefore the way we are meant to respond should also be different because he has set us apart. We see a good example of this at the cross when Jesus responds to those who put him there. Rather than condemning them and wanting them punished, he simply prays to his father and asks for forgiveness. And when we consider all the mocking he'd received, the brutality he'd received, and the way that the crowd turned on him and at the end, Jesus' statement of forgiveness is utterly amazing. It reveals the depth of love and grace that Jesus had for those of that time as he has for us of this time, in fact, the whole of humanity. And it's quite a contrast to the way the worldly often react. As I was preparing uh, for today, I took some time over it, spent a lot of time in prayer with God. And what often happens is he directs me into certain areas, certain things to read. And one of the books that I was reading, which I mentioned to Jess a couple of weeks ago, because it was relevant to what she was preaching on, um, was a book uh, about grace. And inside that book, it contained a story of a young lady, a courageous young lady called Victoria. You may not have heard her if you've not read the book, because the event I'm going to share with you happened a, a few years ago in 2004, and it wasn't in this country, but in the United States. So whilst it made news over there, it perhaps didn't make the same headlines over here. Victoria, I would guess, would describe herself as an ordinary everyday person. And she was coming back driving one evening in a car, and she'd been to her niece's vocal recital, so she'd had an enjoyable evening. But unbeknown to her, she was about to have an encounter with another vehicle. This vehicle was packed full of boisterous teenagers out joyriding. Earlier that same evening, they'd broken into another car and stolen a credit card. And with that credit card, they'd gone on a bit of a spending spree. They'd purchased lots of video games to play, lots of films to watch, and loads and loads of groceries to consume. Included in that purchasing was one rather large item, which I'll come to in a moment. As the vehicles got closer to each other, they were going in the opposite direction. For some reason unbeknown to me, and it didn't certainly explain it in the book, one of the youths wound down the window and leaned out of the window and grabbed this big item. It was a 20 pound turkey. And for reasons unbeknown to me, he hurled it towards Victoria's car. Quite what his intention was, I don't know, but the outcome was it shattered her windscreen, it bent her steering wheel inward, and it smashed right into her face, breaking every bone it encountered. It, result, it resulted in her needing emergency surgery. That surgery lasted for eight hours. And it, at the end of that surgery, her face was pinned together, stapled together, you could say, by titanium plates. Her eyes are fixed with synthetic film. Her jaw wired and a tracheotomy to perform to enable her to breathe. It was only the start of what would be a very long road of recovery and rehabilitation. A very painful road was to follow. When the news broke in the media, at first there was an initial reaction, as you'd expect, of shock and horror of what had happened. But then that reaction changed to anger. Commentator after commentator, internet blogger after internet blogger, described what they would do to the youth who threw the turkey if they ever got hold of him. And indeed, that person was apprehended and, you could say, brought to justice. And some nine months later after the event, 
uh, his day in court would come and Victoria would be able to come face to face with the one responsible for her horrific injuries. During that nine months, there had been many occasions where there was excruciating pain. There had been many occasions where there had been dark days and there was further procedures that needed to be followed. But at least now, nine months on, she was able to walk into the courtroom unaided. The boy naturally pleaded guilty, but his lawyer had done a deal. Uh, I think they call it a plea bargain or something like that. And basically, he was pleading guilty to a lesser charge. The verdict was he'd spend six months behind bars followed by a five-year probationary period, the need to take some counselling and the need to perform some community service. Once again, this was reported through the media and once again, there was an expression of shock at why the sentence was so lenient. That reaction quickly turned to anger as questions were asked, why is this punishment so soft? But the answer was simple. Victoria had pleaded to the judge for leniency. And as the two came very close together in court, she grabbed hold of him to comfort him and whispered in his ear, I forgive you and I want your life to be the best it can be. Someone much wiser than me once said, grace is shocking. It's just like a jewel nobody ordered. A burst of light that came into a room where everyone forgot it was dark. And it had certainly been a dark time for this young woman, Victoria. But despite her circumstances, she enabled light to shine through. And the way she reacted is, I'm sure, the way exactly that Jesus would have wanted her to react. And quite a contrast to the way the world typically reacts. An amazing witness, you might say. Jesus himself uses contrasts all the way through his teachings. And in this parable, he contrasts an all-powerful king with a lowly servant, an enormous debt with a paltry sum. We can see from today's reading that Marjorie gives us that the parable can be broken down into five parts. Peter's opening question that sets the scene for the teaching, the king and his subjects, the servant and his fellow servant, the king's response at the end, and the application of the parable for us this day. Peter's framing question is, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Now, it's worth remembering in those days Traditionally, rabbis taught that a brother or sister could be forgiven three times for the same offence, but not a fourth. So in those days, the teaching was there was a limit to forgiveness. So maybe Peter was trying to be superior or clever by doubling the normal number and adding one. Or maybe it was an expression of the time he'd spent with Jesus that he felt obliged to go beyond what was normally expected. Regardless of his motives, he didn't reckon for the reaction of Jesus rather than being congratulated for going beyond the cultural norm, not for the first or last time he gets corrected. Now, he could spend some time working out the number. In some versions, the, the wording that we heard today is slightly different. Is it simply 70 times 7, which would um, calculate to 490, or is it just 77? Either way, it's a large number. But to spend too much time speculating that puts us in risk of missing the point that Jesus is making. And that's simply this, and it's a point for each of us. As believers in him, we've been forgiven far more than we'll ever ask to, be, to forgive. And this, of course, was countercultural then as it is now. Even when someone close to us offers us forgiveness, how often is it if we repeat offend, we're reminded of those past times? Whether consciously or not, those things are usually remembered. And should we mess up a second, third, or even fourth time, we're told about it. It's a stark contrast to the way God deals with things. Once forgiven, our sins are forgiven permanently and never used against us again. So if we who believe in him are to truly follow him, we to follow the one who redeemed us, we must also be prepared to act like him and do like he does. So the challenge for us clearly from this parable is to cultivate a spirit of forgiveness and not keep count of the times that we are offended. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul puts it like this, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And in the earlier verse to, that led up to that um, statement, Paul lists a number of characteristics that we take on 
as, as we take on the image of God. And humility is one of those eight characteristics. And together with the other seven that he lists, which you can read at your leisure later, culminate in love, a love bound in perfect harmony, a love that literally has the power to change the world. Humility is a grace that grows in our hearts, but a choice that we must make each day. As we move back to the parable in verses 23 and 24, we're introduced to the two main characters of the story, the all-powerful king and the lowly servant. As often is the case, we don't have all the detail here. We don't know what the type of king he is at the outset. Typically in those days, kings were, were despots and they were all powerful and often ruthless. Whatever they said went. They literally held the power of life and death in their hands, the welfare of their subjects. And they were also entitled to sit in judgment as we see as we move forward through this parable. The servant role is quite different. It's simply to serve the king, to do as he commands, to be obedient. And the one brought before the king um, owes a huge debt. In some versions, it's referred to as 10,000 talents. We've got bags of gold in the one we heard today. A talent in those days was the largest piece of money in existence. And some commentators I read reckon it would equate to about 20 years worth of work for a servant. To give a contrast to the, the size of the debt, then it's worth remembering that 29 talents of gold were used to create and build the original tabernacle that the Hebrews um, deconstructed and reconstructed as they moved and wandered in the desert. The more splendid and permanent temple built during Solomon's reign cost 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of silver. So it can be in no doubt this debt is overwhelming. We might be tempted to ask, how could such a lowly servant amass such a huge debt? But again, that could be a distraction. Maybe he had the responsibility for collecting taxes and he'd done a bad job. We don't know. Um, but the point of this narrative really is this, that the debt is enormous and a time has now come to deal with it. In verse 25, the king orders the belongings of the servant and his family to be sold. We've already established the size of this debt and therefore we know that in taking this action it wouldn't get anywhere close to clearing what was owed because the sum owed is simply too big. So the action that the king orders isn't a solution, more a punishment. And it was common in those days for that to happen, particularly amongst the Gentiles. So what the king is doing here is nothing that unusual. The servant realising what is happening falls down on his knees and begs for forgiveness. He asks for more time to pay off his debt. It's interesting he doesn't ask for the debt to be cleared, just simply a little bit more time to pay it off. The problem with that, though, is no matter how hard the servant is prepared to work, and for no, no matter how long, there's no way he can keep that promise. There's no way he can clear that debt. Some commentators reckon it would have taken about 200,000 years, and clearly he didn't have that amount of time left. But the king decides to go beyond what the servant has requested and not simply give him time, but actually write off the debt altogether. He decides to forgive the entire sum, marked in full as if nothing was owed. And it's not because of the way the servant was that draws that forgiveness. It's just an expression of kindness and compassion and a choice to be merciful. You could say, as we, as we sang a couple of times recently, an example of outrageous grace. And it's a beautiful illustration of what God has done for each of us. Because like the servant, we too have amassed an enormous debt. Scripture clearly shows us how much God loves us, but it also shows us how much God hates it when we have sinful desires and, and we commit sinful actions. In fact, in one of, another one of Paul's letters, we're told the wages of sin is death. But the God that we serve, the God uh, that created us, doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to offer us grace. He wants to offer us the means to be reconciled and to experience the kingdom of heaven. But this is only possible one way, and that way is the cross. And Jesus' willingness to come and settle our debts in full, to do something that we couldn't do. It did come as a cost. He had to endure beatings, mockery, excruciating pain, and even temporary separation for the, from the Father for the only time in eternity, so that through his blood we may be washed clean 
and through his sacrifice we may be redeemed. It's really impossible for anybody to put into words the enormity of what God has done for us or to fully understand the depth of his grace that's been offered. Even at our worst in our rebellion, rather than condemn us, God offers us grace. In the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel puts it like this, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. It's a simple yet truthful statement. In the original Hebrew language, I'm told that the word that we have in our Bible as mercy would be rachmanim. Now, given my track record for pronunciation, it's almost certain I'll have pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, but what's more important is the word ends with an im, which in our alphabet is I am, and that signifies that it's plural. So it translates mercies rather than mercy, and it means God's mercy is, is so great that it can't be contained in a single word. In short, his mercy has no end. Interestingly, the Hebrew word for sin is chatter, and that doesn't end with an im. That isn't plural, it's singular, which means no matter what our sin is, no matter how great we might think it to be, the mercy of God is greater. It means we can never exhaust God's mercy. He has more mercy than we have sins because he is truly compassionate and loving. Someone definitely wiser than me, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, put it like this. There is, more wonderful, there is no more wonderful word than grace. It means unmerited favour or kindness shown to one who is utterly undeserving. It is not merely a free gift, but a free gift to those who deserve the exact opposite. And it is given to us while we are without hope or without God in the world. As we move back to this parable, you would think the one who's benefited from, some, from such outrageous grace and been forgiven such a huge debt would now be filled with a spirit of compassion. He should now show a forgiving spirit and anybody who owes him anything, he should surely be merciful. Because the one who's received mercy surely must be merciful. The one who has been forgiven much surely must be willing to forgive. And it's not long before we see that put to the test as the servant has an encounter with a fellow servant. Of course, here, the relationship is much different. It's a peer-like relationship. And the debt that is owed is very small in comparison. But the reaction is also much different. Rather than being moved with compassion and doing like had been done to him, the fellow servant takes, sorry, the forgiven servant takes the fellow servant by the throat and tries to choke him, demanding immediate payment. Like before, the servant falls down and asks for his debts to be, um, asks for time to pay off his debts and promises that he will pay everything that is owed in full. The difference here, of course, is that was possible. There was enough time for that to happen. Yet, the forgiven servant chooses not to be merciful at all, not to offer any more time, but instead has him cast into prison. Those witnessing that, the other servants, having seen what happened, are outraged, understandably. They will have heard what, is, what the king has done. I guess in any age, news travels fast, and news that the king has forgiven such a large debt would have certainly given them plenty to talk about. And now they see the beneficiary of such grace and such forgiveness treat a fellow servant in such a terrible way. They don't waste any time in letting the king know what has happened. So once more, the forgiven servant is brought into the presence of the king. But this time, the situation has changed. He's greeted with the words, you wicked servant. Because it was required of him to do as had been done to him. The king required of him to be forgiven, to be merciful, to show the same grace. But he chose to do the exact opposite. And now it's his turn to go to prison to be tormented. The parable clearly shows us the importance of a forgiving spirit. God expects his children, us, to take on his likeness and resemble him in the way that we behave and with our willingness to forgive. And if we can't forgive, then we're not really his children. In James, he puts it like this. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's from chapter 2. God is rich in mercy and grace, 
but he is also holy and just. And those who refuse to forgive should not imagine that God would welcome their unforgiving hearts into his kingdom. It's easy to say as believers, we should see things differently. We should see things as, the, as our father sees them. It's easy to say when we read the Bible, we should take on board what it says and allow that to uh, direct how we live our lives. You would think in a way it would come naturally. Now we're reconciled back with the father, but transformation takes time. And that's kind of a little bit alien to us in a way because we live in the age of the instant. We can get things at the uh, click of a finger. We can get hold of food. We can go to a fast food outlet, um, queue up, give our order, and by the time we've driven round to, to pay for it, it's ready for us to, to collect and eat. We can get instant credit. We can go into a shop and, and get something without any actual physical money changing hands. We can communicate each, with each other very easily, whether we're in the same room or not. We could be at the other side of the world, and almost within a blink of an eye, we can send a message and it can be read. But some things still take time. Some things still are a bit of a slow cook. The inside-out change that Jesus offers is one of those things. Salvation is truly the ultimate gift, but the new creation Jesus promises takes time, perhaps a lifetime. Our, our eternal future changes in an instant due to who Jesus is and what he has done. But our transformation as individuals takes a lot longer. And it can be frustrating at times as each of us struggle with the day-to-day -day challenges of life. Hasty words, compulsive habits, seductive temptations. Someone once said that there's no microwave solution for spiritual maturity. It takes time. So maybe that's part of what Paul is referring to when he writes to the Philippians and says about working out our salvation with fear and trembling. As committed believers in Jesus, we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit more clearly over time. And we start to see the thing, the things differently and see the world as the Father sees it. We start to think differently and think with the mind of our Redeemer. And forgiveness is critical to a healthy relationship with God and it's a critical to a healthy relationship with each other. We are called to love our neighbour. But the truth is sometimes what our neighbour does displeases us. Sometimes we hate what they do. But the truth is God sent Jesus to the world for everybody, not just for us. Because he loves all. And he wants to give all the same opportunity to be reconciled. But the only way for reconciliation, of course, is through the cross, and some will choose not to, to take that. We should be clear that in order for us to receive forgiveness, we must be prepared to forgive too. We cannot overcome evil with evil. In fact, Paul says evil can only be overcome uh, with good. He talks about that a lot more detail in Romans chapter 12. The challenge for us today is to ask ourselves the question, do we show in the way that we conduct ourselves, the way that we live our lives, that we are recipients of grace? Or do we behave a different way? Even some of the great characters we read about in the Bible, such as King David, widely regarded as the greatest king Israel has ever had, even he fell short of the glory of God when he sinned with, against Bathsheba and her husband, committing adultery, arranging for Uriah, her husband, to be killed. Yet, he was a child of God. Yet, he had a good relationship with God. And it took somebody else who was courageous, this time a man, a man named Nathan, to tell him also a story, you could say a parable, about a rich man with many sheep and a poor man with just one lamb. And the rich man stole the poor man's lamb. David's reaction initially was one of, sure, this man is worthy of death. Until the wake up and smell the concrete moment came and brave Nathan said, you are that man. Grace is something that has to be renewed in each of us each day. If not, we're in danger of looking more like the world than people, the people of God. The picture of debt in this parable is telling. And the truth is, our debt is also enormous. Our sins are more than we can count. 10,000 talents or bags of gold does not overstate our indebtedness. And at the same time, what is owed to us is not worth talking about. The parable puts things properly in perspective. 
Let no one be amazed at the enormity of the debt we have to our God, but let's stand in the, amazed at the mercy and grace which has forgiven us all our debt. A debt we could not pay and a debt we do not need to pay because Jesus has done that for us. So let us follow our master's lead. Let us be people of forgiveness, not those who keep count, but those who just keep forgiving. Let's remember what it says in the Lord's Prayer. If we do not forgive those who sin against us, uh, the God and Father of Jesus Christ will not forgive us. If we take this parable to heart, the result will not just transform the church, but it will truly change the world. Allow me to finish with some words from that same book that I got the story about Victoria. It said this, Mercy withholds the knife from the heart of Isaac. Grace provides the ram on the thicket. Mercy runs to forgive the prodigal. Grace throws a party with a robe, a ring and a fatted calf. Mercy bandages the Samaritan's wounds received from the robbers. Grace covers the cost of a full recovery. Mercy hears the cry of the thief on the cross. Grace promises paradise the very next day. Mercy pays the penalty for our sin at the cross. Grace substitutes the righteousness of Christ for our wickedness. Mercy converts Paul on the road to Damascus. Grace calls him to be an apostle. Mercy closes the door of hell. Grace opens the door of heaven. Mercy withholds what we have earned. Grace provides a blessing we have not earned. So may we pray together. Father God, we do thank you uh, for who you are. We thank you that even at our worst, you want the best for us. We thank you that you give us that opportunity to grasp a relationship with you through what you've done in sending Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to pay our debt so that we may enjoy a full and abundant life. May we be a church that is known for the way that we act and may that act be one out of grace and forgiveness. May we embrace your teachings and may you truly be Lord, not just of this place, but of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>